Um, but uh, I wanted to welcome, everyone's welcome to turn their video on. It's meant to be like a small, fun little discussion. Uh, I wanted to mention to welcome my, my good friend, Dave Morin, um, live from the gymnasium he sits in all day long. <laughs> um, and Dave is, um, you know, obviously has an illustrious career uh, in technology from, you know, early days at Apple to Facebook and platform there to starting path to, you know, doing a bunch of awesome investing and kind of on to some new stuff now. Um, but he's also just most importantly, one of my absolute favorite people to bullshit about the world and ideas with. And, you know, we were talking the other day and we were just like, look, we always love talking to each other. It's fun to have new voices in a conversation in a small setting. And we were just really sick of talking about politics, and pandemic, the P and P. So we wanted to have a discussion about other stuff. Um, and it's that was unclear kind of like, if we will be able to talk about anything else, but we're going to try. We're going to try really hard. Um, we're going to try really hard. Um, and again, I think I think just to set ground rules, we can't refer to PNP, but like it's pretty hard. <laughs> like, for, instance, for instance, here's my, the first question I want to start with, Dave, is I think everyone in this group and again, people chime in. This is meant to be like a small batch. Like, you know, you can you can unmute yourself and ask a question. It's, it's supposed to be a manageable number of people. Um, and obviously introduce yourself if you do chime in and want to. Um, but I say, Dave, the first thing I kind of wanted to bullshit with you on a little bit is like the future of something that's near and dear to your mind, both of our hearts, which is what the hell is going on with social networking right now? <laughs> you really you want any, it, had to throw, you had to throw me under that bus first. Well, I think it's just something you and I both have a lot of experience with and I'm trying to figure it out. Like I'll give you like, we're doing I want to know what Mark Cantor thinks. All right, right Mark Cantor, you're, you're on the stage. Okay. So um, fascism is supreme. And, uh, In Facebook social networking? Makes, yes. And Facebook makes a lot of money uh, sp creating QAnon, creating Holocaust deniers. Create, I mean, this is – Facebook caused that, right? Now, I'm not going to blame you, Dave, because so, I know you, you were gone by then. But uh, So, Mark, just to push well, you on that. So you can blame me. I mean, we've all got some handle, you know – We've all got responsibility to bear on this. A lot of us in this room were on this very Zoom were in a lot of the most important conversations in the rooms where it happened, as it were. Um, one of the things that I dislike going on is that I think there's a lot of revisionist history going on um, about, you know, there's there's some things going on in talking about social networking that tell kind of a revisionist history of what we what we might have known or didn't know. And anybody that was around back then knew that we really did not know a lot of what has happened was going to happen. I mean, I don't think it was possible to even imagine what a world would be like where 2 billion people are using these things. Like, I just don't even, I think we were able to think about some things, but. There was this sense that, you know, I always loved the metaphor that Steve Jobs used at Apple, that the computer was the bicycle for the mind. And I think a lot of us in the early social networking days were very focused on this being the creation of new superpowers and, uh, you know, something that would be deeply uh, nourishing to the human desire to socialize. And I don't think... Mark, to point at something that I, too, am extremely worried about, but this Q stuff, like, nobody could have predicted that. Not Definitely not how it's playing out. I think you could have reasonably sort of said, well, will the rise of a digital cult happen? Probably. But, like, how? Who knows? You know, anyway, I don't, I don't know if that's where you wanted okay. to go with this, Sam. I, okay. I sort of view this as somewhat politics, you know. Well, but. I, I think... Can I just chime in for a second? I, mean, I think like there's a few things to separate out here and Dave and, and Mark, I'm curious what you guys, how you guys think about this stuff. But like, look, I think there is stuff that everyone understood from the earliest days because I really feel like we were just playing out a bunch of science fiction experiments, right? The first is we knew, everyone knew, and this is not about Facebook, this is about the internet, that we were giving people, to Dave's point, we call it a new human superpower, which was to speak to everyone instantly on earth, right? With no intermediation, to remember everything, like, the, you know, to, to kind of like process huge amounts of data super quickly. We knew, and there was a huge narrative around, like, you remember like the gap, right? Like 
the end of mass culture and this idea that you could find your niche, even if your thing was super weird and like whatever, you, it, you didn't have to be stuck in kind of mass culture. You'd be able to find the sub communities that you were super into and that those would get increasingly weird and different when they had critical mass around them in a way they could never have flourished on their own. Like we knew a bunch and of- And frankly, stuff. a lot of good came from that, you the know, not just that, you know. Well, I, I go a step but, further, yeah. which is, you know, you think about like people's sense of identity and self, you know, it's super hard to find your place in a world of 7 billion people, but all this stuff about sub communities of people finding their niche and finding what they're great at and being known in their sub community, you know, if it can't be physical anymore, like you're the best basketball player in town, right? You're the worst, you know, you're the 10 millionth basketball player in the world, but you're, you're the best basketball player in town. That's gone. So people have found ways to, to segment themselves and create rational communities. I think that's all like pretty well understood. And for what it's worth, Dave, I, I think we understood, everyone understood that even before with the rise, not everyone, people who were paying attention knew that about the early internet and were excited about it. I think yes. what is challenging is it doesn't, when you think about like, there are places we need mass society, right? Uh, to work, democracy being one of them. Like, I don't think people were focused on, or frankly, I don't think we have any answers about how the internet masses with places where you actually need mass agreement and mass society, right? Definitely, yeah, most definitely. It's uh, just, so I want to give a historical- That's a problem. Point. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I, I want to give a historical point. I'm in a party with a guy named Jonathan Abrams. And he's telling me about this platform called Friendster. And what he was delighted about was that he could put a copyright at the bottom of every page. And then he claimed that he owned the content of every single thing anybody put into the network. And so he's monetizing and Kleiner Perkins is funding him and thus was born Friendster. And so I built social networks for like almost 10 years. And not once did I ever think about oh, I could monetize a user's data and I can make money from it, which is, of course, exactly why we failed, right? And so at the end of the day, I'm going to blame money. I'm going to blame greed. You know, you follow the money. And for those who are money motivated, because you, Sam, you could talk about all this idealism, but at the end of the day, we're all pawns of the system and Zook is playing us like a fine violin. And Roger so McNamee has pointed that out. It's exactly laid the groundwork of exactly what happened. So I'm playing us or just I'm gonna obviously yeah, go ahead, disagree with you on that, Mark, <laughs> right? Like both in terms of motivations and and kind of the reality of you know what I've seen and experienced. Obviously, um, I do think that like in the end of the day, um, I actually believe, and I'm sure I, I think Dave would agree with me on this too, that that the narrative around that community has been really misunderstood and that actually Mark yes. is probably the least motivated, financially motivated person you've ever met in the world, like versus it being yeah. some sort of, so like, I just think that's wrong. I agree with that. Um, um, but, uh, can I, can but, I argue for creativity and expression, right? So what TikTok has shown and Instagram is that you can have this tool to express yourself. You can play the social thing, which gets you virally blown up. But at the end of the day, those people, whether it started with YouTube and really blogging, so blogging, YouTube, Snap, Instagram, TikTok, that's not Facebook, right? Yeah, that's right. So but I think there's this other social angle here of expressing yourself. And then if you can make money from that, beautiful. Well, you know, Mark, Facebook makes money out. for itself. You know, it's not for. So us. We, we, we should probably talk about other, We can keep going on this or talk about thing. I want to hear yeah. what other people want to talk about in the community. But I will say this, Mark, which is. You know, from a narrative perspective, when you worry about QAnon, about a lot of this type of stuff, you know, I'm a huge fan of YouTube. I think it's an unbelievable platform. I'm an even bigger fan of TikTok. I think TikTok is one of the most magical products ever, right? But honestly, you got to separate out reality and narrative. Those platforms are full of hate, right? And they're full of really bad shit. And like the fact is, we like to talk about Facebook, but the reality is, is that when you look at the broader picture, I mean, TikTok is a tr amazing, and I love the platform, but it is terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a terrifying platform. So yeah. I think we got to, like, I do think we have to frame this as a conversation about the internet overall. I do and think we that, all, like- We all know why Trump attacked it, right? Because the TikTok kids created all these false uh, reservations for the Tulsa rally and made them look bad. And then all maybe. of a sudden he's attacking TikTok. You know? I don't know. Yeah, Jeremiah, maybe. Jeremiah, I I here? Yeah. 
So Sam, I agree with you that Mark is not money motivated, but I think he is capital motivated, like social capital. And I think the people who I met before I came to Silicon Valley, I actually went and talked to a professor on my way to Silicon Valley. And he was like, be very careful about working at Facebook. And that guy worked at the NSA. And so I think the people who actually had the problems where they were like capturing the market externalities, like the government was, they saw this coming ahead of time. And I think in Silicon Valley, we didn't see it because we have no incentive to like care for like disinformation is not like a, it's a market failure problem, right? Uh, like no one really owns disinformation, like holistically, there's no sort of like disinformation credit you can trade. Um, and I think that's like, I think that's my, my interpretation of what happened was there was well, no- and, um, my, and my interpretation like, of what happened is obviously self-serving uh, is that we, we failed, at the, so far the internet has failed to produce a viable, trusted real world identity platform, which would help clean a bunch of this stuff. And then on top of we that- tried. We, yeah, but it we has tried been, really damn hard. It has yeah. yet to be created for a bunch of reasons that we can well, get and, into. But Sam, this, and I think both of those comments come together in this interesting th conversation, which is around digital identity, as well as the problems which exist above the pay grade of public or private enterprise in America, right? Like Jeremiah, your point's really, I think, prescient, which is that, yes, like, the United States might have seen this misinformation, you know, or that and other externalities coming, but that was never communicated downstream, right? Like, and partially that's because that's a that's something that exists above the pay grade, right? Well, like, there is an interface that happens between the government and the private sector. Well, but they, these are like extreme cases, right? And Sam, you and I both know a lot of what happened in 2016 was like caught a lot of people off guard, right? Like, and I think a reason why is that the budgets, you know, whatever, Russia's misinformation budget is like so far, I mean, it's it's like, we're talking about GDP level spending that's happening in order to produce this sort of information warfare. And that's something that like, you know, does a, does a singular American enterprise need to worry about this? You know, how do they find out about it? How does that collaboration happen? And the same goes, on the identity side, and Sam, I know this is something you know I have talked extremely at length about, but it's not even clear that a private enterprise can provide the kind of identity solution that needs to happen to create a, a you know a viable framework at national scale, right? Like, and so I think there's like there's real conversations that should be happening about this at a technical level um, that exist in this seam, which you know, we don't have leadership that wants to focus on those things right now. That's fine. Hopefully we will in the future, but you know, that's the way I look at it. So can I ask you specifically about that? I mean, this is like, I think, you know, it's something that you can be afraid of either version of it, right? Like, you know, there's the bottoms up form of identity where you have lots of validating people, institutions, et cetera, creating composite, you know, vessel of like, should I trust, should I not trust, et cetera. Then there's the other version, which I know you and I have both advocated for in different formats and forums, which is it's insane that the government, the U.S. government doesn't provide a form of like portable digital identity. Um, now, I wrote a call with that recently in the information, and I have never gotten from smart people so much hate about it. People being like, this is the end of the world. How dare you da, 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 about proposing that? But like, I think it's I think that's the wrong side of history. Talk to I me. Mean, talk a little about kind of where you think this goes. Yeah. And, you know, you know, this is one of my favorite topics. And look, I understand the side of the argument that that fears this, right? Like there is reason, there is fair reason to fear it, right? Like you can go down the authoritarian, what goes on in China. Like if we could just for one minute, put aside some of that and consider what, a, what, what, what this might look like for America, I think it's like a reasonable conversation to, to think about. And in one of the one of my favorite ways to think about this is what if we were able to establish a digital identity and digital citizenship for America, which carried the force of law, right? Like you could sign documents, you could vote or sign your vote, you could buy houses, whatever. Digital identity carries, you know, it's effectively your passport plus the force of law in the digital realm. And then we started to say to people, well, America has the most robust and secure digital identity on the planet. And it's backed by the power of the US currency, the US military, everything that makes America, um, America. 
And, um, you know, we would like to extend that to anyone who would like to apply on a global basis. And we basically say to people, you can become a digital citizen of the United States. Um, that doesn't make you a inside of our borders citizen, but it begins to extend some of our value set beyond our physical borders, right? And I think that gets really interesting. Like, how could you extend digital freedoms to people in countries that are war-torn, right? Like you take a country that is disintegrating like, you know, Venezuela or, uh, you know, many of the others that we've seen over the last few years. And you say to the citizens, like, look, this is a thing where we can extend to you identity. We can extend to you maybe even secure communications um, and, you know, enable you to migrate to wherever you're going to go. Maybe it's not the United States, but you're carrying with you an identity that like is trustworthy and, you know, carries, you know, uh, the, 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 the stamp of the United States. And then if you do decide to start coming to the United States in a legal way, like that provides you with a pathway to begin that process digitally. And, you know, um, rather than, you know, the convoluted mess that we deal with right now. And so to me, it's like that type of thinking gets super interesting. It becomes a, not just a, 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 a you know, a way to extend American values into the digital realm, which very clearly need to happen, right? Like, um, but it also, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think starts to provide a, a totally new framework to think about how to make immigration like an actual, really, you know, 21st century um, uh, version of the process that we can actually have like a, you know, cogent sort of, conversation about rather than the nonsense that's going on right now that like nobody can like you know really even get their hands around Dave, um Dave, anyway that, do, you, Dave, um, Dave, do you see uh, estonia as the model the yeah you know i think estonia is a really interesting model I, I mean is it the model um you know i haven't studied their model in all of its bullet point detail I do like one thing about it, and I've actually talked to the former president of Estonia, you know, um, who who worked on this. He he he's lecturing at Stanford now, and um, you know, his main point, if he were, I think, on this call, he would say, uh, it must carry the force of law. You know, it must be a, a, a true force of law token, right? And the the question of how to achieve that um, is the, I think, probably the most difficult one because. I think to account for the people who, you know, are worried about this, we would have to do this in such a way that it's decentralized, it carries encryption, it, you know, uh, you know, the government would really have to say we are going to do this in an American way, right? And it has to really, really be that. And I think that that's where it gets really hairy, right? Um, but it's not. Out, out of reason, I don't think. Like, you know, we've all been debating blockchain and, you know, tons of different new protocols and technologies over the last decade that, you know, those may or may not be the right one, but they are the set of ideas that could carry things like this, it feels like. Cortina, can you jump in? You were going to say something. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea of rule of law associated with this identity, but I, it's got to be more than about freedoms, right? Like it, it's not going to solve these problems that we're talking about if we just give people more freedoms. Like I, I think the implication of like, if this is supposed to solve a problem with the internet, it's got to carry with it like responsibility and reputation and risk. And it seems like <clears throat> Americans are terrified of this, like the Chinese idea of the social credit score. But I mean, the fact is that you're, if you live in a soci society with other people, you do have to like do work to earn the trust of the people you interact with. And I like what in your mind, Dave, what are the <clears throat> responsibilities that are associated with this digital uh, identity that would be issued by the government? Like, and how are those? Well, I, I would love to call on, you know, one of the, one of my absolute favorite thinkers in the world is on this call right now, Bill Reduschel. Um And, you know, he, he, uh, he was an uh, extraordinary uh, CTO and, you know, uh, of some of the most important technology companies of all time. And 
you know, I, I could go on and on about Bill's background, but, you know, Bill, I think you've got some really interesting thinking about architecture as it relates to these types of um, uh, uh, opportunities. And to me, like, I'll just say one thing, Cortina. I mean, I think you have to do something where you create an architecture where people have, you know, full control over their, their own house, their own data and what gets in and out. And, you know, that really has to happen. Otherwise this doesn't work, right? It cannot be centralized. And, you know, the reputation system has to have some sort of permeability in and out of your own, you know, container in some, but some regard. Like, if, I, if I steal your, like, your bicycle, like I can't erase your memory of that theft, right? Like, and so the question is like, who's, how much, like I have control of my actions, but do I really have control of the rest of society? Should I have control over the rest of society's like information about <clears throat> how trustworthy I am? But, yeah, I mean, obviously, like, I will say one no. thing, I'll say one thing. Issue. This, is, this is the big issue. I mean, Cortina and I have been talking about this extensively, but like, this is why I hate GDPR and what it leads to so much and why the Europeans have this so deeply wrong, right? It's like, you don't own your identity. Your identity, like you can yeah. own, and like any any society that thinks you do, right, um, is I think in for a world where it's impossible to coordinate these things. Like your identity is not, you don't own your data, like fundamentally. Yes. And I, I actually think not only that, but I go one step further, which is not only do you not own your data in the real world and you can't have reputation if you do, and like we, we're going down the wrong spit there. But this is what I find so deeply ironic. I'll even say fucked up about, people on the left, oh, sh the politics, sorry, not people on the left, some people who <laughs> believe that like you should, uh, that like you should be paid for your data, right? Um, because it's funny, it's like your information is like the single thing that still exists in our world that is unmonetized and is like replicable for free and flows in a non-capitalist way. The second you're like, oh, your data is valued and it's worth blank and you can sell it, you're basically taking a, the last final stream of what I think makes us human and has a whole own its own economy and like monetizing it and 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 valuing it in a way that was going to push in a very very different direction than people people realize. Um, but Dave, what were you yeah. just said? Let me let me, let me uh, just put one more thing on this and then I'll shut up and leave the floor. Like I I have Cortina. One of my um, the things I focus on the most when talking about this is not. The stuff Sam was just talking about, it's, to me, there's a single thing that's really important, which is asymmetry. And I think that one of the most interesting things about what happened with the whole blockchain movement is that you ended up with this, you know, whether you use that technology or not, or you just have some database somewhere that's keeping track of a ledger of interactions, or to your point, this action happened between that person and that person, and like that gets logged into a ledger somewhere. One of the biggest problems in society is asymmetry. What do you know about me that I don't know you know, right? Like, and this is a massive problem on a global basis. Like, what is authoritarianism really? It's a central authority gathering all this data about you that you don't know that they know. And so therefore they have power, right? And so if you can figure out a way to do an identity system like this in the American way, to me, that would mean there was no asymmetry. And then you can start debating, you know, where does data live and all these types of things. And how do you create centralized, you know, or, or centralized, decentralized systems that account for reputation and currency and like these types of things. But you have to solve for asymmetry, right? Like everyone needs to know what everyone knows about everyone. And that's like, no, to me, one of the best things that's about a, that's a, that's a, that's a That's a really mess. Personally, I believe. That, that is a it very is scary future. Um, I think um, like, I don't. It, it's reasonable to say that, that I think that as a government, that the government should not be able to have private records on citizens. I believe that. And but that they, they do. They you live up. in a country where they do. You have they no do. idea what the NSA has about you. Maybe, but, but that's a separate issue from like, am I allowed to know things about you that you don't know I know about you? And I actually think the second you start encroaching on the sanctity of memory, which has never been historically a thing that we've talked about. Like we always talked about freedom of speech. We've never talked about freedom of memory. Freedom of memory is even more fundamental than freedom of speech, right? Which is why I hate GDPR. It's why we're down the wrong spit. But it also means that like, you have no right to audit my memory, right? Yeah, um, Sam, to be clear, do, that's a yeah. different, let's put, to, let's put a stake in the sand between 
citizens to citizens and citizen to government, right? Like I think these are, there should be no asymmetry between me and the government that I am living under, right? Like there's probably a bunch of edge cases we should talk about, but even the level of asymmetry in American society right now, I think we should all be up in arms about, right? And I think that was a lot of what the whole Snowden thing was. And, you know, there's just a lot of, people can't put their finger on it, but they're like, you know something about me that I don't know, uh, you know, and that makes me uncomfortable, right? Well, and so I think I that's wanna, like a reasonable thing yield, to discuss. I want to yield the floor to someone else, yeah. but I will say one other thing, because you, you and I have talked about this before, I think it's fun. Jeremiah, you got the next mic, is um, to that point, Dave, I do think one of the things you talked about in the carrot and stick for American citizenship is imagine a world where the rule was, I think this was originally your idea, right? That like, okay, if you're an American, you get to know everything the government knows about you and you're, you have it. But if you are not, right, then we as America get to keep whatever records we want on you and you don't have access to them. So it's not just a carrot. It's not just a carrot in terms of great access to commerce or whatever, but it's literally like, that's the deal. Like we're going to keep aggressive records on all foreigners. And if you want to be, know what they are, then you have to become an American. Well, I, I actually took that even further to say that we should use the force of our foreign policy and military strength to go also guarantee your identity outside of our world. Right. Like we should actually go, given that we know who you are and who you are digitally, then we should be able to go eliminate your identity problems on the dark web worldwide, right? Like, and that to me is like something that America should be doing for its citizens. Like the fact that like Equifax is, or whoever is like having these problems with American citizens data, like we should just handle that on a global basis. Like we, we definitely know how we're just not doing it. Like, and so to me, like, you know, you could go that far with your thinking. Um, Jeremiah, jump in, jump in Jeremiah. Yeah. yeah. Why, like, when I think about American things, you're talking about things that are American. I mean, this is, this may get like, tell me if I'm touching political, but like the most American thing is a contract-based system of rules, right? We have a, we have a constitution, like by which we decide what we're gonna do and not do. And Bitcoin seems incredibly American. And so like, I think when we talk about exporting Americanism abroad, it seems like the solution here, like that would actually fix this is to come up with an identity that's distributed on the blockchain that people have incentives to join. Um, yeah, I, don't understand. I guess that's, yeah. that's, that's what I meant, Jeremiah, but what yeah. I don't want to do is make this about blockchain because I think all of us could really get into whether or not, you know, blockchain's great, but, I, you know, you can also make like a highly secure MySQL database that like has a great ledger system that looks an awful lot like blockchain, right? And so I think, that's my yeah. whole thing is like, I just don't, I don't want to get into like that as the technology or whatever. I'd rather stay yeah. in the idea level of this stuff. I mean, yeah, there, there is a thing we could hijack, right? Which is the real ID program, Dave. Right? The real yeah. ID program is the one that I mean the state's own identity, not the federal government. Is that what that is, Mark? This is the US passport card. Yeah. Oh, cool. I've never yeah. seen one of those. Yeah. You can get them, they're free. Or you know, they're ten dollars or something. But yeah. but that's only if you have a passport. But the real ID, ID work. Them, what? How does real ID work, Bill? Well, real ID, you have it's whether you got a star on your driver's license or not. Yeah. And after next October, you won't be able to fly with your driver's license unless it's a real ID. And it's what the does same it principle. really do, though? What does it really do? It well, it, it means you guarantee it, 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 they've guaranteed citizenship or residency. And is that, and, is that because you went through some extra hoops <laughs> yes. at the DMV? Yeah. And, yes. and yeah. But like, so what are those extra ID. hoops? They're actually pretty hard. Check boxes. No, I, I, I went through it because you had to. And like, it's, it, you know, it's still a weird DMV process, but it, it's not zero work, right? To, I mean, you have to do it if you want to fly, but. The question is, do they put one of Bill Gates's chips in your brain? No. Oh, bummer. It's a little, a little California bear, you know? Oh, nice. And it goes onto your... You're thinking, like, look, I've got a California bear on my driver's license. I mean, but, it, a, but Bill, to your point, is it an actual technical system? I mean, that, that's sort of... Well, they're, the, they're linked and standardized. Look, they, one company owns the software that runs 43 DMVs. So it, 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 if you wanted to go build this, this is not that hard. Um, their no, databases are all online, and you could go get that. So... You could hijack the system 
It oh, wasn't totally. intended for this. This is one but, of the things that drives me crazy about this is it feels like this isn't like when we're up in the like budget of America stack, this right. is not a, this is not that bad of a problem, you know, like, and it's just a question of like, should we go do it? And one of the big reasons why I was, you know, I was running the technology committee for Pete Buttigieg's campaign and he was super interested in this stuff. And we were working on a pretty comprehensive plan around this. And so to me, it's like, this stuff isn't, it's not rocket science, definitely not solving COVID, you know, um, but it's, it's stuff that if it is done and we do it elegantly, it could be very powerful. Um, PSA wants to be able to take your license and drop it in and instantly verify that it's you and that you're qualified to drive. That's the whole point. So they're going to build, the, you could hijack, well, they're building it for the airlines, but the airlines are a system. And it's guaranteeing that you're a good actor to get on the system. It's no different than guaranteeing that you're a good actor to get on the network, right? Totally. It's the exact same problem. And yeah. so you get a rec me, electronic replacement for TSA. And, and look, Bill, that to me is one of the best things about this is like, if we could move towards something like this, then, you know, you potentially end up with like a world where you might have a safer internet, you know, to Cortina's point, like, you know, if you could get to something where you feel like there is a part of the internet that you can operate inside of that feels safer, like it feels American safe, but doesn't feel authoritarian like China, like, and I understand this is not easy, but like, it feels like that could be really amazing. It could be, but there is the give a, give a mouse a cookie problem, right? And the problem is not, I mean, like, I do think that the counter argument, right, which is, my God, how many people don't have identity, issues with the state, issues with dissidents, et cetera, are legit. And so for me, it's like all like, okay, how do you implement things like this in a way that solve some of the obvious problems we have, but don't, you know, it's kind of like, I always analogize. Legit, but managing them with cages at the border and when all of these people have phones is insane. Do you know I, what I'm saying? I, like, I'm with you. I, I just think it's like, my analogy is always, I always think about like the stage we're at is like uh, in, in technological history. It's kind of, I always think X-Men is a good analogy for it, which is like you have, we all just got this like massive set of superpowers, right? And like, we're in this like really messed up place. No, we're like, all like teenagers trying to figure out how to handle these superpowers. And like, it can go really badly or really great. And like, you kind of don't have a Professor X running around, but it is just like unleashing a ton of power and giving it to teenagers who aren't ready to handle it. And everyone's trying to figure out what to do, right? And like, I just think like, that's kind of like, the problem is that we obviously sit in a generation in a space where we're, we, I think everyone's aware. And I, don't, I disagree with the narrative that like no one knew it was coming. Like, I think we, these were all big, go read science fiction from the 80s like we haven't invented we're just playing out narratives that everyone knew about or at least people were paying attention to about um uh, okay I, okay so i, I want to point out that the key thing that dave said was and it has to be backed by law right and let's not forget we're just climbing ourselves out of a prohibition on a natural herb that because black people smoked it they vilified it and made it illegal and ruined several million people's lives and yep. literally created a gateway because if you're sent to jail for smoking a joint, you come out of jail a criminal. Yep. And so that, you know, okay, now, so that's law, right? We also have uh, politicians gerrymandering, going back on the voting thing. We're about to appoint a handmaiden to the Supreme Court. And so may I suggest that Though this is an idealistic, wonderful thing, we've got to dig ourselves out of this hole we have right now. It's going to take at least four years to undo uh, the past four years, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, law sounds great, but unfortunately there are, not, what do you point, 300 judges? And he bragged about that, that they held up all the Obama slots for judges so that they could put in 300 uh, of their fascists? I mean, oh my God. Mark, Mark I do, I appreciate you just like violating the no politics and pro, and, and pandemic just directly. You're just like, screw it, I'm going all the way. Yeah, just no, because no, it's law, no you talk about students. law. <laughs> That's what law is, right? Law is made up by politicians yeah. who are usually white men. And may I so, point out who's on this call? There ain't anybody here. There's a couple of women, but they're not showing their faces. I mean, this is the era of the white man. And until we move on beyond that, we get a little balance here with some woe man. Jewish men here. Yeah, well, okay. So, but the point is, is that 
in an idealistic sense, as Bill pointed out, we're very close. We got the tech there. I, I'm carrying around these cards right now. We can do the tech. Uh, by the way, I want to give credit to Dave. Dave, he's the first person to ever use the term citizen dashboard. And whether he knows it or not, I went off for five years and tried to build a citizen dashboard. So, <laughs> okay, so open data and being able to have access to this and having every citizen have the right to have their own interface that's not being monetized by some other crook that has cut a deal with the politicians, that itself is we're still 20 years away. You know? Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like it's a, it's some, I mean, Mark, I think, you know, to stay at a meta level, you're right. We've got holes to dig out of and a lot of very important things, but it still feels like a worthwhile vision, you know, like, can we get there? Like, I feel like that's, that's like a, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a worthy question. Oh. One well, uh, question for you. Yeah. Just to, yeah. play, to play devil's advocate, like, you know, I, I get the idea of like, I, you have identity, then you get reputation, and then like you can have like enforcement of norms. But it does seem like um, if you look at the public sphere, you know, there are a lot of people who are on television and social media using their real identities, many of whom are leading the country that don't seem to care about reputation or at least the the... The idea that, um, you know, attaching your actions and words that are sort of in violation of what a lot of people would say are ethical is a enforcement mechanism is maybe not <laughs> a valid uh, hypothesis. And, like, so I'm wondering, like, you know, is identity actually going to be helpful at all? Or like, yeah. is there like some other I, more I, fundamental? I, I, help I think it's a super what? good point. I think it's a super good point, Cortina, because I think that's the other thing that's gone on is like reputation and so norms matter. But I mean, I'm not sure I understand the point because Cortina, just to make sure I understand before you respond, Sam, like, mm -hmm. are you saying that? Because what I heard was that freedom of speech is potentially a problem when combined with this sort of notion of real identity. No, I'm just saying that I, it, once you get identity, then you can have like a record of my transgressions against society and my like uh, lack of ethics. But that no longer seems to be a deterrent to many of the people operating in the public sphere. I, I, I think it's a broader problem than just the public sphere. I actually think it's, and here's why. Here's my analysis. Do you guys know this kind of theme of like, you only need 300 super fans to create a like, you know, you're living and whatever. That, that is broadly correct. Like you look at what's going on, like only fans or like things like that. There's, it, it used to be that if you wanted to have a reputation and livelihood and live in a town, you kind of needed everyone to mostly be okay with you, right? And like mostly be on the same page or you need a broadly good reputation in a world of micro identity and targeted identity. The reality is, is you can live in a world of APIs and like just, you know, wherever you want. And as long as you have like three or four or five or 500 people who love what you do, fuck everyone else, right? And so I actually think that that's the place we currently live and we're going. It's not just about politicians. It's about kind of this fracturing of where you need a reputation to get done what you want done in the world, right? And there's very few things we broadly rely on everyone for anymore, right? And so I don't actually know how to un... I don't know how to go back on that, right? Like, because it is, again... It's great that if you're into like, I don't know, knitting kitten sweaters in the color purple, you can find the 500 other people who like that and build a life and a reputation and an identity and be happy in that zero. I mean, the, the most extreme version of the VR future where like VR is so good that actually you just need yourself and you just play with the AI all day long and you don't really need anyone else, right? And like, so there's like the spectrum of like, I don't know how you create civil society or to Cortina's point, a place where reputation matters. Um, with that as the backdrop versus being in like what we're used to, where like you kind of need everyone to be cool with you. And like, if you you fuck up your reputation, it's an actual problem. So, okay. So That's I actually powerful think, question, Cortina. So I actually think that is the American ideal, right? So Dave has his own vision of what he thinks America is and he's a brilliant thinker. And so he's got this very high end ideal. And in fact, we can't even get 50% of Americans to come out and vote, right? Yeah. And, and most Americans don't have passports. And yep. for both world it's wars- not true anymore, Mark, for two facts on that, because I looked it up recently. One, the most yeah. Americans don't have passports anymore is no longer true. That's changed dramatically in the last- And the second thing I'd say on that, interestingly, just for your information, because I looked it up recently, voting has never been higher. 
So it is true that most Americans still don't vote. But if you look since like 1700 forward, voting is actually at an all time high. It just started from a basis of zero. Go talk to somebody in Europe. Go talk to somebody outside the U.S. They're flabbergasted at how little Americans care about their politicians, what happens to them. Right. And so uh, the fact is that Americans want to be left alone, that they don't want to have government telling them, except when it comes to abortion. But, you know, again, we won't go there. And so the point is, is that this vision of America, in fact, there is no melting pot. We are completely decentralized. And we have this federalist system of these 50 states where, you know, half the time they're agreeing, half the time they're not. I can't even grow reefer in one state and bring it over into another state to sell. So poor Oregon has too much reefer and they can't export it somewhere else, right? I mean, yeah, like the whole thing is just absurd. And it's because of these politicians who are all trying to play the game, play the system. All right. Guys, we're at time and I'm sure people yeah. have stuff to do today. Here's, what I do about want to do Jessica? One last, Jessica one last hasn't thing. said anything. We need the women want... here. <laughs> okay, so Jess, I would like Jessica and Dave in that order, because it's a good point, Mark. Jessica is, is I want, because this has been a fun, but not a super uplifting conversation. Uh, <laughs> can we, can, can Jessica and Dave say like two things they see happening in the non-PMP world that they're like excited about or optimistic about right now? And Jessica, you can make Dave go first if you want an extra second to think. No oh, way, <laughs> he's going first. No, you can go first, Dave. <laughs> two things. Like anything, anything, literally come up with anything you're excited about. <laughs> <laughs> look, I, okay, I am really, ex look, uh, one of the most downloaded categories of apps in the app stores last year was meditation apps. And I think that's really, really interesting and positive. And the analogy that I always say to people is, after World War II, when we stopped working in factories and started working in offices, the concept of a gym appeared. And, you know, our bodies started to not be as used as much for the work that we were doing. And so we had to figure out a way to stay healthy. And so, as we all know, gyms are just like a part of society now. And I look at where we started this conversation, you know, with some uh, of the doom and gloom around social networking and the Internet and technology. And um, I look at what's going on with health and wellness and um, in particular digital health and wellness as a really positive trend. And, you know, most of them are really simple right now and are like podcasts with an app wrapper on it, you know, and I sort of feel like 10 years from now, that world's going to be wildly more interesting. And these things are going to be like remote control buttons for your health that are like really, really interesting. And I don't know. That's that's one of the things I'm I'm really optimistic about. Fair enough. All right, Jessica, back to you. Mine's less deep, but I'm just excited for when life starts to go back to normal. Hopefully, sometime next year. Nice. That's a perfectly good answer. I, I I hope that you're right that it goes back to normal at some point next year. I don't, cool, I don't right. think there ever will be a normal. It will never go back to the way it was. There'll just what be is another normal, pan anyway. Well, there'll no, be we another don't. pandemic. There'll be another kind of virus. <laughs> That's what I think. The um, All right. guys, this was super fun. Um, thanks for doing it. We're using you know live stack as a platform we're building to kind of have fun little conversations on Zoom. So um, thank you all. Let's do it more, uh, Sam. For sure. This I miss doing this with you, Dave, and friends. <laughs> See everyone. Talk to you. Bye.